continue today our studies in the great letter of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians. Uh, let me introduce this passage. You will recall that the beginning part of this whole letter to the Ephesians, the first three chapters, is a marvelous exposition by the Apostle of God's eternal purpose being worked out in the historical process in Christ and in the church to create a new society, his own new society, his family, his redeemed people. And in the second section of the letter that we're studying now, he is indicating the kind of behavior which is worthy of this calling, which is fitting to the status that we have as the people of God. And so far he has applied this principle of what is worthy and what is fitting, both to the church itself, the unity and the diversity of the church, and to the behavior of the individual Christian in terms of probity, honesty, speech, love, anger, and so on. And now in the rest of the letter he uh, introduces two further dimensions of uh, Christian living. The first concerns the very practical down-to-earth realities of our relationships with one another at home. And the second, which we consider next Sunday morning, concerns the enemy we face and the equipment we need in the unremitting spiritual warfare that the Christian knows in his experience. Now these two responsibilities, at home and at work on the one hand, and spiritual warfare on the other are obviously very different from one another. Husband and wife, parents and children, employers and employees are visible, tangible human beings with whom we need to learn to relate. But the principalities and powers that are arrayed against us are invisible and intangible spiritual beings and again, we need to learn to relate to them in the sense of learning the secrets of conquest and victory in spiritual warfare. And if our Christian faith is worth anything, it's got to be able to cope with both situations. It's got to be able to teach us how to behave Christianly at home and at work. And if we're Christians in church but not at home, or if we're Christians on Sundays in church, but not at work on Mondays, then our Christian faith is useless. It's got to teach us how to behave Christianly in our home and our work. And it's got to enable us to fight against the devil in such a way as to stand and not to fall. So these are the fascinating subjects with which Paul concludes his letter to the Ephesians. Now this morning then it's Christian home life, Christian marriage, and tonight home and work. Now I am sorry if you've all come expecting me to talk exclusively about marriage, because uh, I shan't come to that until uh, towards the end. I feel the need to introduce the whole subject about these three relationships husbands and wives, parents and children, employers and employees, because Paul brings them together, as Peter does in his letter as well, in his first letter. You see, all three come under the heading of home life, because in those days the slaves were part of the household, although the contemporary application of the third pair is more to our work than to our home. Now the introduction, the rather lengthy introduction, on which I think I need to concentrate, is that all three are examples of submission. The reverse standard version is right to begin this whole paragraph with verse 21, the subject to one another, out of reverence for Christ. And to see all three paragraphs as examples of this requirement to submit. Thus wives are mentioned before their husbands and are told in verse 22, be subject to your husbands. Children are mentioned before their parents and are told in chapter 6 verse 1, children, obey your parents. Servants are mentioned before their masters and are told in chapter 6 verse 5, servants, be obedient. Now this concept in all three pairs of submission to authority 
is extremely unfashionable today. There is almost nothing that is so calculated to arouse vigorous protest among young people as this kind of talk about submission. Ours, as we know very well, is an age not of submission, but of liberation. Liberation for women, liberation for children, liberation for workers. And anything that savors of oppression is deeply resented today. And the question is what we, if we're Christian, ought to say to this contemporary mood. I wonder how you'd answer that question. I'm sure our three nursing friends are not leaving out of protest uh, because I've hardly started yet, but they're on duty. Uh, and I wanted to explain if they were embarrassed as they were leaving. Now, I want to say that our initial reaction to this uh, mood of protest against authority today, our initial reaction, I believe, should be one of welcome. That is to say, we Christians need to agree that women in many cultures have been and still are exploited and treated like servants in their own homes. And you will recall, I'm sure, the well-known thanksgiving of the head of the Jewish household in the first century, thanks be to thee, O Lord my God, who hath not made me a woman. Or he added a slave or a Gentile. Again, we have to agree that children have often been suppressed and squashed, not least in Victorian England, in which they were supposed to be seen and not heard. We also have to agree that workers have often been unjustly treated and have been given inadequate wages and living conditions and an insufficient share in responsible decision-making. And we Christians ought to agree with this, that it's been a great deal of oppression of women, children, and workers. And we need to acknowledge with shame that Christians, we ourselves have sometimes acquiesced in this situation and so perpetuated situations of drudgery and oppression, instead of being in the vanguard of those who are seeking change. And I want to say at the beginning that there is absolutely nothing in these paragraphs that is incompatible with the true liberation of human beings from exploitation and oppression. On the contrary, to whom do women, children, and workers chiefly owe their liberation? Is it not to Jesus Christ? It is Jesus Christ who treated women with honor and courtesy in an age in which they were despised. It is Jesus Christ who said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them from coming in an age in which unwanted babies were consigned to the local rubbish dump. And one might add, in our own generation, are consigned to the incinerator. If you've read that most appalling documentary, Babies for Burning, about the modern abortion traffic. It's Jesus Christ who taught the dignity of childhood. Jesus Christ who taught the dignity of service and who said, I'm among you as a serving man and who got in his hands and knees and washed the apostles' feet. We Christians need constantly to affirm the dignity of womanhood, of childhood, and of servanthood. And we need to assert the equality of all human beings irrespective of sex or age or social rank, because all human beings, whatever their sex, age, and rank, are created in the image of God and have this godlike dignity. And we need to assert the even deeper unity of all believers as fellow members of the family of God and of the body of Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul, all through the Ephesian letter, you see, has been affirming this new society, the family of God, in which all barriers are broken down and there is a unity and a oneness in Jesus Christ. Now, we may be quite sure that he isn't immediately going to contradict himself. Paul, in this passage, isn't denying his own thesis. 
He isn't now erecting new barriers of sex, age, and rank in the one and only society in which they have been abolished. He has plainly affirmed in his earlier letter to the Galatians 3.28 that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. He asserts the equality of the sexes, you see, in Christ. And he is not contradicting himself here. How then are we to interpret these three paragraphs in which there is a requirement of submission of the wife to the husband, the child to the parent, the worker to the employer? Well, I plead in our biblical interpretation for this principle of harmony, that we should see the scripture as a whole. We should never isolate one passage from the rest, but learn to let scripture interpret scripture and not allow one passage so to be interpreted that it contradicts another. And if elsewhere the apostle asserts the dignity, the equality, and the unity of all mankind, we must give him credit for a certain theological consistency and not imagine that he is repudiating himself here. The submission that he requires in these three situations is not to be understood in terms of inferiority. Submission is not the same as inferiority, not in the very least. And I think we need to grasp what Martin Luther understood so well, and Lutherans in the Christian church today keep emphasizing, and we need to listen to them. We need to grasp the difference between persons on the one hand and the office or role which they fulfill on the other. Let me give you as an example the law court. Imagine two men in a law court. They are equal in the sight of God. All men and women are equal in the sight of God. There is this basic equality, you see, because of our descent from Adam and because of our creation in God's image. Now here are these two men in the law court, equal in the sight of God, with equal dignity as human beings. But if one is the magistrate, and the other has to appear before him in the court, the magistrate's position gives him a certain authority to which the other must submit because of their different roles or offices, despite their basic equality. And it's exactly the same with husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and servants. They have equal dignity as God-like beings but they have different God-given roles. And the husband, the parent, and the employer have a certain authority of office to which the author under God is required to submit. Now, there are two questions about this authority that we need to consider. The first is, where does it come from? And the second is, how is it to be used? Where does it come from? It comes from God. The God of the Bible is a God of order in nature, in society, and in the church. And an ordered society is the will of God. And in his ordering of society, in the state and the family and employment, he has established certain authority or certain leadership roles. And since this authority, although it is exercised by men, is delegated to them by God, we are required conscientiously to submit to it. And that is the point that is clearly taught here. Look down at your text. Chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, be subject to your husbands as unto the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 5, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters, as unto Christ. In other words, behind your husband, your parent, your employer, you must see the Lord himself who has given to each his authority. And then if you mean to submit to him, to the Lord, you must submit to them because it is his authority which they exercise. Now, having seen that vitally important biblical truth, it's very important not to overstate it. It does not mean that the authority of husbands, parents, and employers 
is unlimited. It does not mean that wives, children, and employees are required to give an unconditional obedience. It does not mean that. The submission commanded is to God's authority delegated to men, and if therefore men misuse the authority of God and command what God forbids or forbid what God commands, our duty is no longer conscientiously to submit, but conscientiously to refuse to submit. For to submit in such circumstances would be to disobey God. And the principle you see in Scripture is absolutely plain that we submit to the authority of husband, parent, employer right up to the point where obedience to them would involve us in disobedience to God. And at that point, civil disobedience is mandatory. It is our Christian duty. And in order to submit to God, we refuse to submit to men. So you see the authority is from God and the submission required to it is to God's authority, but not when that authority is abused by men. The next question is, how is the authority to be used? And here it's of great importance to see it is to be used for the benefit of others. <coughs> Indeed, I think the most striking feature of these paragraphs is that in each relationship there are reciprocal duties. It is true that wives are to submit to their husbands, children to parents, servants to masters. It is true that this requirement of submission presupposes an authority in the husband, the parent, the master to whom we submit. But have you ever noticed this? When Paul comes to the duties of the husband, and the parent and the master, in no case is it authority which he tells them to exercise. Instead, explicitly or implicitly, he warns them against an improper use of their authority, he forbids them to exploit their position, and he commands them to give to the other party the respect they deserve and the rights which are their due. Husbands are to love their wives and to take care of them. Parents are not to provoke their children, but to cherish them. Masters are not to threaten their slaves, but to treat them with justice. You see, so let me sum up this lengthy introduction. Authority in biblical usage is not a synonym for tyranny. God has indeed established authority roles in society that every person in any position of authority is thereby in a position of responsibility. Responsibility to the God who has delegated the authority to him and responsible to the people over whom he is to exercise it. And therefore, biblically speaking, authority spells not tyranny but responsibility. Responsibility to God himself and to the human beings made in the image of God. Now, I don't believe, you see, you can understand this teaching about husbands and wives until you first understood that, which is equally applicable, as we shall see tonight, about parents and children and uh, masters and employees. Now then, husbands and wives, for a few more minutes. Wives be subject, husbands love. That is the uh, skeleton, the framework of the whole paragraph 22 to 33. Wives be subject. Now the reasons given for this submission are drawn first from creation and second from redemption. The creation argument, verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife. Now the fact is stated there boldly, without explanation, but it is elaborated elsewhere in particular in 1 Corinthians 11 that we don't have time to turn to, but in those other passages the arguments are that woman was made after man, as we heard in the first lesson uh, today, she was made out of man, and she was made for man, and these are three facts of creation. So Paul's argument is not based on culture, not based on the changing culture of the Roman Empire. His arguments are derived from creation, not from culture. And since he argues from the facts of creation, 
the fundamental truth, he states, is permanent and universal and is not culturally limited. I believe we should not be afraid to maintain this, however unpopular it is in our own culture today. Our human sexuality is part and parcel of our creation. Masculinity and femininity represent not only a physiological but also a deep psychological distinction that goes right back to our creation. And what God has created, no culture has liberty to destroy. And as a result of our creation, God has given to man, and in particular to the husband in marriage, a certain headship, a certain authority, a certain responsibility, and his wife, if she is to find her God-given freedom and fulfillment, will find it not in rebellion against that fact of creation, but in humble submission to it. Now that is the argument from creation. Then there is an argument for redemption, verse 23, as Christ is the head of the church. But if creation explains the relation between husband and wife, redemption illustrates it. And the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body and its saviour. And verse 24 is the wife is uh, subject to her husband in everything as the church is subject to Christ. It's a beautiful truth that the husband and the wife in everything in their relation to one another can reflect and adorn the relation between Christ and his church. Now we come to husband's love. And here Paul uses two metaphors to emphasize the expression extreme sacrifice, devotion and care which his love will involve. The first is Christ's love and the second is self-love. Christ's love, verses 25 to 27. Jesus Christ showed his love for his bride, but Jesus has a bride, the church. And the whole story of the church is the most beautiful love affair in human history. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. I've known young men go from one ends of the earth to the other in order to seek their bride. But he came from heaven to earth, and that's a longer journey still. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And he loves his bride, the church. And so much does he love his bride that he gave himself to the death of the cross. And that Calvary love is to be the standard of the husband's love for his wife today. Husbands must love your wives with a love that seeks the wife's highest welfare and is prepared for the utmost self-sacrifice in order to attain it. And the other standard is self-love in verses 28 to 33, and we don't have time to go into the details. But you know the Old Testament law that says we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, which is a very high standard because we love ourselves a great deal. And now husbands are to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Because the wife and the husband are united and become one flesh, part of each other. And the husband who loves his wife is loving a part of himself. And if he loves his own body, he looks after his own body. Nobody neglects himself. He cares for it, nourishes it, and he'll do the same for his wife. Thus the standards of a husband's love are Christ's love and self-love. He's to love his wife as Christ loves the church and as he loves himself. And that kind of love, you know, is bound to lead to sacrificial caring. Now before I conclude, I want with very great brevity to say two or three things here to the girls who I know find this passage very difficult. And I want to say again, it's with great brevity, four things that I believe are very important. The first thing is this. Remember that verse 22 follows verse 21. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit. Verse 21 says, Submit to one another. So you see, if it is the wife's duty to submit to her husband as wife to husband, it is also the husband's duty to submit to his wife as Christian to Christian. Submission is a universal Christian virtue. Submissiveness is to be required of everybody. Every follower of Jesus is submissive. 
And the wife's submissiveness to the husband is just a particular example of a general Christian grace. That's the first thing. Second, the person to whom you are to submit is not an ogre, but a lover. And I imagine there is all the difference in the world between those two. The scripture does not say, wives submit husband's boss. It says, wives submit husband's love. And if you believe that your wife should submit to you, love her until she's willing to do so. It is love that gains submission. Submission to a lover who cares. And the third thing is, it's to a lover who loves like Christ. With Calvary love. Girls say that this is a very difficult passage of Scripture to obey. Listen, it's far more difficult for the husband. Look at the standard that is set to the husband. He's got to love his wife as Christ loved the church. He's got to be willing to die for her, to give himself up for her, which is the highest standard. Well, that brings me to the fourth point, and that is when you see wives submit husbands love. Love and submission are two different words. But when you start defining them, what is the difference between them? Very difficult to say. What does it mean to submit yourself to somebody? To give yourself up for somebody? What does it mean to love somebody? Give yourself up to somebody. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Submission and love are two aspects of the same thing, which is self-giving and self-sacrifice. And that is God's ideal for marriage, and that is the secret of enduring happiness in married life. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this paragraph of Scripture which we believe is revealed truth from you. And we believe that a stable society depends upon stable marriages, and we long to be able to commend this high and holy view of marriage to the whole community, not only to the church, but to the whole community in Britain and in the world. Help us not to be ashamed of it. Help us to maintain it in the marriages of our own church family, and also to commend it to society at large, not just by our theological arguments, but by making it visible in the love of Christian homes. Hear our prayer for the glory of your great name. Amen.